Hello, I'm Carlos Santamaria, Associate Editor with DevEx. We're here with Dr. Stephen Hall, Director General of Worldfish, an international nonprofit research organization dedicated to reducing poverty and hunger by improving fisheries and aquaculture. This hangout is part of Feeding Development, a three-week campaign to start an online conversation about solutions for a more food-secure fo future, focusing on four main topics, the environment, land rights, supply chains, and nutrition. Stephen, when the, um, when the international development community talks about food security, fisheries in general, and aquaculture in particular, are often only mentioned in passing. Why is this so, and what can we do to change this perception and take aquaculture to the top of the food security agenda? I think one of the main reasons why fisheries and aquaculture seems to be missing from the food security agenda is because historically the narrative around fisheries and aquaculture has been around the sustainability of the resource rather than the purpose it serves. And so um, all of the conversation is about whether we're seeing overfishing, how do we restore fish stocks, rather than talking about the role that fish play in people's lives, particularly as a food resource. Um, so I think that the, the, one of the key things we need to do is shift the narrative and shift the narrative also from a really rather simplistic one that says if we get the resource management right, food security issues will be solved or dealt with, to one which says, well, food security is a, a, a rather more complicated than that, and it, it's got multiple dimensions to it. It's not just about how much fish we produce, it's about who has access to that fish and how it gets used. And we need to broaden the conversation about the role of fish in food security to talk not only about how much we supply, but also about how different groups, particularly the vulnerable and those who are uh, nutrition insecure, can derive the benefits from what fish provides. And, and how can, um, how can fish, uh, fisheries, and, and in particular aquaculture, um, appeal to these groups? Like, for instance, in, in poor regions like in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, aquaculture has been around for many years. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of Egypt. But, um, but it hasn't been able to contribute on, on a massive scale to, um, to fighting food security. What are the main challenges um, here, and, and how can they be overcome? Um, I think if you look historically, it's certainly true, particularly in Africa, that despite the promise and, the, and the, the capacity to grow fish in Africa, it really hasn't been a great success story. Egypt is the, large, the, the main exception to that. But for the most part, particularly during the 70s and 80s, there was considerable investment, uh, development investment to try and stimulate aquaculture. And that focused primarily on teaching people how to grow fish. Um, in fact, the, the issue was less about how to grow fish and more about why would you grow fish. And the main reason fish farmers grow fish is because there is a market and there's money to be made. And I think the connections to markets and the um, opportunity to make a business out of aquaculture was the piece of the jigsaw that was missing in the 50s and 60s, uh, sorry, in the 70s and 80s, um, largely because uh, the infrastructure, um, the size of the markets was insufficient to support the industry. Um, and there was a lot of hope over promise about where fish uh, aquaculture could be done in ways that would have those connections. That landscape's changing quite dramatically, uh, particularly with the growth of urban centres, the opportunities for peri-urban and, and closer uh, rural areas to serve or urban markets and the recognition and need for fish uh, rising and the growing price of fish have meant that the economics of the situation have changed and I think if we do put in place the, uh, the incentives, the training and the technical capacity, we'll see a much more dynamic industry in the future in Africa and we're already starting to see it in places like Ghana, in places like Nigeria and in places like Kenya. Uh, what, what sort of in, in, of incentives would you um, would you put in place? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, what what way would you be able to, would we be able to um, to involve the the private sector on a on a much bigger scale? Because I'm I'm just seeing a lot of opportunities for the for the private sector in 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 this case. I think the key is a joined up conversation with government at national scales. Uh, one of the features uh, and one of the challenges that 
the private sector faces, so at least at the production end, which is often in small scale, small and medium enterprise fish farming, is access to quality fingerlings um, and quality feed. And so there's quite a lot that can be done to encourage dialogue with government, um, to encourage larger feed producers into countries, perhaps through providing tax incentives and others to establish their, uh, their businesses there, to supply the inputs that the small scale sector needs to really grow. Um, and there are also conversations about you know, road access, access to markets, um, the infrastructure to support the training and capacity building that's needed and the investments that governments need to make in um, breeding programs and supporting the development of a hatchery system that really can supply the, the fingerlings that are needed to really allow the, the industry to grow. Mm -hmm. um, many experts regularly claim that, um, that eating fish and, um, and seafood uh, in general has, uh, has significant nutritional advantages over, uh, over a meat-based uh, meat diet. How would you make the nutritional case for funding um, aquaculture over farming on land? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's important to make that point. Um, fish is a really valuable and important part of a balanced and nutritious diet. It's got a lot of advantages over other animal source foods, um, particularly in terms of the environmental footprint, uh, the demands for um, uh, feed and the like are significantly lower per kilogram of fish produced than, for example, beef. Um, and certainly issues around greenhouse gas production and land demand are, are significantly less. Um, but there are pluses and minuses to the animal source food system you might choose to invest in. So I wouldn't claim that on every dimension fisheries and uh, aquaculture rather has got that uh, kind of a lock on the, uh, on the environmental advantages. In the nutrition space, it's certainly true that some fish species are especially nutrition, is especially valuable, particularly in terms of uh, uh, the essential oils and fatty acids that are really critical to brain development. And we do know that uh, omega-3 fatty acids and the like can have really significant and positive impacts on fetal development and growth and uh, cognitive development in young children especially. Um, so I think there are, there are arguments for a solid nutrition base. But I think more broadly, fish is a really key part of a balanced and nutritious diet. And we need to make that affordable and available as part of a um, of the whole food basket, mm -hmm. and um, and how can um, how can donors and and, and aid implementers uh, change change their ways? I mean, apart from what you were saying, we starting the the conversation. Um, what are practical ways that things things that can be done uh, on, on the ground and in and in conference rooms um, for uh, the the aid community to truly um, make this make this affordable and accessible to poor people around the world? I think there are a number of things that need to be done, Carlos. I mean, uh, certainly supporting the dialogue that's needed between governments and the private sector and facilitating that dialogue, it's providing the support to facilitate that dialogue, I think is really important. And supporting the kind of strategic analysis that's needed to understand how supply and demand is likely to evolve into the future and the economic constraints over the development of the aquaculture sector, but also um, the support that's needed to ensure that wild capture fisheries provide all the benefits they can provide too. I mean, one of the things that gets lost in this is the potential through good management of fisheries to very quickly increase the supply of fish at rates much faster often than, than could be achieved by the much slower growth that will take, uh, that will be needed to grow an aquaculture sector effectively. So in a country like Ghana, for example, reforming and helping to bring um, the smaller scale fisheries back onto a sustainable path, particularly the pelagic fisheries, could lead to very dramatic rises in, in supply really quite quickly, as could investments in um, reducing waste, reducing post-harvest losses in the fisheries sector that would you know, instantly provide increases in supply of, of, of affordable fish for poor consumers. So I think there's a whole raft of interventions that need to be couched in terms of the fish food system as a whole, rather than thinking about one kind of single bullet that needs or single trigger that needs to be pulled. Mm -hmm. um, going back to, uh, to nutrition, um, I find it quite, quite odd that countries like, for instance, East Timor, where I know that World Fish has a, has a long-running program, or, 
for the Philippines are, are island nations, but comparatively they consume very little fish. Um, what can be done to, uh, to get them interested in, in aquaculture, for instance? Well, I think there's a distinction to be made between um, getting people interested in aquaculture as a means for growing fish and encouraging consumers or making it possible for consumers to 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 eat fish and, and shift their dietary preferences. Um, I think one of the key things around that is price and accessibility. Uh, and in fact, in countries like Ghana, for example, which on the coast, there's a, a huge history of eating fish, but inland, actually relatively little. We're now seeing quite dramatic changes in the appetite of consumers in those traditionally non-fish uh, eating regions to continue to, uh, to start to eat fish because the price point's more affordable and um, the, the word is kind of out that it's a it's a nutritious and, and well balanced form of uh, form of animal protein. We see the same thing in Egypt. I mean, Egypt has seen a growth in fish consumption uh, that's largely on the back of a very very vibrant aquaculture industry that's brought the price of tilapia down to make it the lowest animal source food. It's 36 percent cheaper than chicken or poultry. So. Uh, and and the inc industry now produces one fish per person per week and in a country of 86 million people that's not bad going and so I think there's a whole combination of things around accessibility availability and market access that will inevitably see consumers begin to um, increase the proportion of food in their food baskets well thank you very much Stephen it was uh, it was a pleasure having you um, if you're interested in food security please remember to follow our campaign feeding development stay tuned to the uh, the devex for more coverage